Okay, welcome. We're going to start on time because we have quite a, a big lineup. And what a historic day uh, it really is. I mean, if you think the title for the event, The End of Empire, we're seeing it crumble in front of our eyes. And I, I want to begin with Gary Young's quote from The Guardian today. We're led by a party not fit for purpose in a system not fit for purpose. It's like, what on earth is going on? Has anybody seen anything like it? So today we're going to have the analysis of what's happening and how we came to be in this state. Um, so I am Beverly Skeggs from the Atlantic <coughs> Fellows Programme here in the Inequalities Institute at the LSE. Will Hutton is going to speak for five minutes about the Progressive Economic Forum. We'll then have Danny Dorling for 15 minutes. Um, Danny is the professor, I've got to get this right, the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford. Um, and Danny completed his thousandth public lecture on inequality in Shoreham this week. So he's been fighting the campaign long and hard in a variety of different ways. You probably know him through all of his books, which are quite remarkable in, in so many different ways on statistics, visualizations, geography, global politics, uh, everything. I wouldn't have time to go through them all. Uh, and the book, of course, which I'll show you again, the book, uh, Rule Britannia, was written with Sally, Sally Tomlinson, who is the Emeritus Professor at Goldsmiths, but who now said she spends most of her time as an honorary fellow in Oxford in the Department of Education. And Danny said that's because she has a free car parking space, which <laughs> became, you know, the most important element in all of this. And then they will be followed by Gaminda Bambra, who is the Professor of Post-Colonial and Decolonial Studies in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex. And Gaminda has written brilliant books on rethinking modernity, post-colonialism and the sociological imagination and connected sociologies. I forgot to mention Sally's books, which are about inclusive education and manufacturing inability and education and race from empire to Brexit. So we have a huge range of expertise with us here. And so first to speak for five minutes, and I will be controlling people quite tightly. So I don't think I'm rude. We just have to get everybody in because there will be time at the end for you to ask questions, but not a lot. So I'll be strictly controlling that as well. Um, but if you'd like to begin, Will, and tell us a little about the Progressive can Economic Forum. Can I stay here? Forum. I you can stay there if you'd like to. What do you like? Stay here. <laughs> stay here. Um, yes, the Progressive Economic Forum was established in May of last year. We've only been going for 10 months. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a council of, um, I was going to say left-leaning, but it's probably, it, I think, less of the leaning and more of the left, perhaps. Um, uh, liberal left economists, um, varying shades of leftness, uh, but all of them um, kind of united by uh, a Keynesian view of how um, the capitalist economy works, keen appreciation that um, the contemporary capitalist economy, both in Britain and globally, uh, is dysfunctional, uh, anxious to make the case for a more enlightened macroeconomic policy, in particular um, against uh, not only the kind of fact of austerity, um, but the, intell the intellectual thinking that went behind it and the character of the kind of, um, public expenditure cuts and non-raising of tax revenues over the last kind of eight years. But also big, thing, big propositions to make about um, the institutions of um, our capitalism, uh, how our banks operate, uh, the constitution of the firm, um, the nature of the social contract, uh, whether we need to, how and how and why we need to remake it. Um, too much risk is being deflected onto the shoulders of ordinary men and women. What to do about productivity stagnation, what to do about the stagnation in living standards. Um, make the case for organized labor and employee voice. Make the case for um, different kinds of 
um, enterprise, particular public enterprise, everything from the public benefit company to the kind of outright case for public ownership and public actors uh, in uh, in industries like pharmaceuticals, where there's an uh, interesting case emerging that actually if the drug companies can't generate the new, the new wave of antibiotics and if private equity is leading to the um, quadrupling and quintupling of prices when patents run out, that maybe one has to establish um, a public uh, drug company. But these are the kinds of things we're kicking around along with the case for a universal basic income. Um, we, are, um, we, we, we meet monthly. Um, we've had a, we're having a series of lectures. Um, I've given one, Robert Skidelsky's given another. Um, uh, John McDonnell is a, is a regular attendant, has also given one, and Danny is giving another tonight. It's a consistent series. You'll find them on our website. Um, we organize podcasts. Um, we're trying to build up our public um, profile. Uh, and we are um, going to want, want to get into the education business, too. Um, we've um, working on uh, an MA uh, in kind of macroeconomics that will um, be launched at Birkbeck. Um, so it's got a number of strands, this. Um, we're very, we, we want to engage with um, members of the House of Commons, um, uh, anyone who's sympathetic to the agenda um, we want to talk to. Um, we think there's a, a big educational job, um, obvious sometimes when there's discussions of the single market customs union uh, how many MPs honestly know the difference, uh, and who knows whether the World Trade Organization kind of is the arbiter of the global service sector or not. I mean, just basic, basic things like that uh, aren't known um, by a critical mass of um, parliamentarians and their staffs. So we want to um, uh, we want to engage in that too. So that's the Progressive Economic Forum, and we're very thankful to um, Patrick Allen, who can't be here tonight, who has actually kind of personally kind of got behind it and without his um, kind of energy and his willingness to write some checks brutally and it wouldn't be happening. So that's me. Um, I'm a member of the forum. I'm delighted to be a member of the forum. We've had some fantastic discussions. I'm looking forward to tonight's lecture. So I'll just get off the stage and go and find a place to sit and join you. Thank you. Thank you. Danny and Sally will be signing their books outside after the event. And we have the Progressive Economic Forum because we do feel that we need to think of alternative ways of existing in this complete crisis situation. And that's why it's very important that we envisage alternatives. So thank you, Danny. Thank you. Uh, thank you ever so much for coming. I'm going to rattle through... Uh, 15 minutes. Uh, before I forget, uh, this talk began with the word inequality, and we're not going to say that much about inequality, save to say that Britain by now has become the economically most unequal country in all of the EU 28, certainly the most economically unequal large country. When we joined the European Union, the European community, we were the second most equitable country by income to Sweden. So we have done the amazing thing of going, going from near the top of the league table to the bottom in a short amount of time. Now, obviously, this was not because we joined the European community. <laughs> um, for those who don't like the European community, uh, it is home to the most equitable, happy, successful states in the world mainly in Scandinavia, but not only in, in Scandinavia. Um, something else happened. Something else occurred to this place to make us the first place uh, since Greenland, and Greenland left before the, the Union, the first place to try to leave. And the, and the definitive word here is try. Um, I'm not going to say much because I'm sure it will come up in questions about what I think will happen uh, except to say for a year and a half when asked this I've replied it is incredibly uncertain 
I think the most likely result will be revoke. Uh, if that wasn't still a possibility, I probably wouldn't still be saying it, and I probably wouldn't tell you that that's what I have been saying. But my personal belief is revoke is still the most likely. Uh, one of my brothers was born on April the 11th, uh, so if they could arrange it for then, that would be very nice. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that for later. Why? Why has this happened? This is as important a question as what is going to happen next. If you don't understand why it has happened, you have no chance of getting the future uh, right in, in any way. Um, and then you, you end up with the questions of why did the reasons that people put forward, why were they important? Um, why did we go from being the second most equitable country in all of Europe to the most unequal. What was the reason? You can guess because we've stuck the word empire in the title of the book and the title of this talk that this is what we think is key and Sally's mainly going to talk about that. I'm only going to go back 1,030 days or something uh, to the actual result because we still do not understand the result. There's so much we don't understand. Uh, it wasn't him. Uh, that isn't Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> uh, that's a young man called Dominic. I don't know where he is now. If we're lucky, he might be here. Um, it wasn't Cambridge Analytica. They, they mattered. Um, when I was a young PhD student, I received 280 magnetic tapes in 1989 containing the share details of everybody in the country. Um, it's legal. The share registry is legal. They've been typed in in Mongolia. What I found most interesting as a PhD student was that they were arranged by the geographical ordering that the Conservative Party uses, because it was clear who the client had been. Um, people on the right have been using target mailing marketing for a long time. Uh, why wasn't it him? Because the bulk of the votes were the old, and a very large numbers of old people are not on Facebook, and it didn't persuade the young. But we can argue about that. The much more interesting question is, why does he do what he does? Now, I'm a geographer. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But what we've done in the book is we've looked into the background of all the leading Brexiteers to try to work out what they have in common, what they have in common in their past, in their histories. Who at Exeter College Oxford didn't dissuade Dominic of the views that he developed in the minor public school that he went to in the north of England? That kind of question. And you may say this is anecdotal, but when you put them all together, you have an incredible picture of a very similar set of men who this really mattered to. Leaving really, really matters to them. And they, not the people who voted for it, the people who arranged and organised it, they have very similar backgrounds and backgrounds that you couldn't have had in other European countries because they don't have the same kind of structures because they didn't have an empire. And it also wasn't this. This is, this is the strongest correlate of the Leave vote. Um, this, this set of graphs were produced, I think, just two or three weeks after the result, showing a correlation between the proportion of people, the dots of areas, the proportion of people in each area who voted leave, and the proportion who had a healthy weight. The more of a healthy weight, the less leave voters, or the proportion who were obese. Um, I feel okay to put this, to show this graphic, given that I uh, am between unhealthy weight and obese. Uh, the, 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 the academic who produced this and published it rather too quickly got pilloried, understandably, by the tabloids because he implied it was fecklessness and lack of thinking ahead on behalf of the larger ones of us uh, that led to this. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think we have this correlation uh, later. But just for those of you who are larger in the audience, we do know from the Human Genome Project that it is not your fecklessness that, that leads uh, to do this. And to you smug, thin people, um, it isn't just because you're well behaved. Um, I'll give you a clue. I've actually got slightly thinner since moving from Sheffield to Oxford. Or even a better cue, I, I spent half an hour earlier outside here. 
And if you're my size and you spend half an hour outside the LSE, you don't half begin to feel it, that you are a bit bigger than average. But anyway, the answer will come up later. And it wasn't deprivation. It wasn't left behind Britain. Uh, this is the correlation uh, between deprivation and the leave vote. A circle for every area, sized by the population in this case, the correlation is 0 0.03. That's nothing. Uh, you may look there and say you can see something, which is why we calculate correlation <laughs> coefficients, um, but it isn't deprivation. I want to go on and look within areas because to get a correlation of 0 0.03, for areas where the poorer people did vote leave more, which is London and Oxford, there have to be an equal number of areas where better off people voted leave more. And if you want a clue as to where that is, it's Devon and Cornwall. Because the better off areas of Devon and Cornwall are where the older retirees from London move to. And older people are more likely to vote leave. It was age. Um, these are the best estimates of turnout uh, and leave and remain voting by age. Uh, the one nearest me, 18 to 24 year olds, for anybody with brilliant young eyesight, 70% uh, didn't vote. Um, that wasn't unusual. 70% have not voted since 1991 in that age group. The poll tax was a remarkably good way to stop young people voting. And even getting rid of it, you had already set that in the stage. Uh, that most of those who did vote uh, agree a uh, blue and vote remain, but most didn't vote and also it's a small cohort. We don't have that many children anymore. Going through, you can see the majority as you get to 65 plus. I know the 80 pluses didn't because they can remember the war, um, but it really was a bulk elderly vote. The picture there um, is about empire. It's a picture of the last colony going, uh, of the sun setting on the British Empire in 1997, and the last governor's daughter crying because it was so sad that the empire was coming to an end. <laughs> um, and this is the night I could, I'll leave Sally to tell you more. The history of our empire is not a glorious history. Uh, this is, if you like, the nicest story. Um, we told ourselves so many myths. This was a myth. Uh, a girl of that age does not cry because a colony is stopping being a colony. She cried for three hours that day. There's video footage of her crying for three hours. She was asked a few years later why she was crying. And she told the reporter about the wonderful boyfriend and what a good surfer he was and how she couldn't understand why her father wouldn't just let her stay in Hong Kong, which he could have done. That's why she was crying. We don't tell ourselves the truth about things? Or why were we in Hong Kong in the first place? That correlation with obesity. The best explanation is that the correlation with immigration is 0.79, almost as high as the correlation with obesity. How could those two things be? This map, the yellow areas are low immigration, less than one in 20 people born abroad. Most of England is low immigration in Scotland. The areas where people voted leave is low immigration. The areas where people vote remain, particularly here in London, dark blue in the centre of London, over a fifth born abroad. Um, immigrants tend to be young, fit, healthy, well-educated and thin. The more, <laughs> the more immigrants that turn up in a place, the thinner on average that place will be, and not only are they fit, but they make you feel fat so you have one less bag of crisps if they're all around you sitting outside the LSE before you're going to do a talk. Um, it's, it's, it's called the epigenetic effect of obesity. It, it spreads. If you live in an area where, where people aren't coming, you slowly, and this happens in America as well, you get fatter uh, on average. It's nothing to do with tardiness or the rest of it. Um, the European map of immigration, I must speed up because Paul Bed tells me off, um, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, most of the mainland of, of Northwest Europe is greens and blues because it's high immigration. The immigration in the mainland of Europe are people who grew up in the Netherlands, met somebody just over the border in Germany, living together, one of them is an immigrant. 
right? There have been no borders for decades, right? It's high immigration. We are relatively low immigration as a country. And when the immigrants come, they come to the places where there are jobs and they don't stay in the places where they accidentally come in somewhere where there isn't a job. Ireland is high immigration. Not because of the Poles who work in the meatpacking factory in Belfast, there aren't enough of them. Ireland is high immigration because a very high number of people in Ireland were born on one side of that border which does not exist <laughs> and live on another side of that border which does not exist. Right? And if you want one of thousands of reasons why you cannot talk about the border that does not exist, it's the fact that that's the colour blue. And by the way, when Theresa May talks about the British people, she forgets that since a Good Friday Agreement, people in Ireland have the right to call themselves the Irish people, and she talks on their behalf too. She may not have read the Good Friday Agreement. Um, other areas of high immigration, Switzerland's very high, but down there in Spain, you can see the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Um, and that the largest immigrant group there are us. <laughs> and if we were to get a hard Brexit on the 11th or 12th of April, they won't all come back. The ones who fall ill will come back to a health service which will be losing its anaesthetists, radiologists, nurses, a third of midwives in the nearest hospitals to this university, a third of midwives, were born in the EU but not the UK, and are not UK nationals. Here's the map. Um, the map is, in this case, just showing you yellow areas, majority remain, blue areas, majority leave. Most of the south of England is blue. The majority of leave votes are in the south. It is not because the South is bigger, it's because turnout was higher in the South. 59% of those who voted Leave were social class A, B or C1. Somebody had a go on me on Twitter yesterday about this, so I worked out the confidence limits from the exit poll. There is a 95% probability that the proportion who voted Leave who are middle class is between 58 or 60%. It's a middle class Southern mainly ex-Tory, UKIP, leave, vote, which is why it's a conservative issue. It's their areas, it's their people, it has very little to do with Labour voters in the North, and certainly not young Labour voters in the North, because largely don't turn out to vote in a referendum. You can read, if you've got good eyesight, two of those. I'll just read you out Hampshire. I can do this for every one of 28 areas and counties in the south of England. In the case of Hampshire, and you get the same story, in the case of Hampshire, more people voted Leave in Hampshire than the combined Leave voters of Bolsover, Doncaster, Hull, Chesterfield, Salford, Stoke-on-Trent and Sunderland, despite there being fewer people on the, on the electoral roll in Hampshire. In every case, you can find a different set of areas in the South, and you will find more Leave voters. This, we, if we cannot even understand the geography of the vote, we are in trouble. Okay, zooming really fast. Really fast. Really fast. We don't protest. This could be very good news if there's revoke. Um, although apparently the army will be called out anyway, which will deal with Tommy Robinson very nicely, I think. Um, we certainly fill in petitions. These are the number of people in Jacob Rees Mogg's constituency. Some of them, maybe many of them, will normally be conservative voters. We are unusual. We are getting our public spending down because of a decision to enact austerity made after 2.10 to around about 36% of GDP. Apart from Ireland, which has a leprechaun version of economics, which I can tell you about if you want to know, apart from Ireland, we are uh, the lowest public spending in all of Europe. The difference between the Labour and the Conservative Party, by the way, is 2%. On what Labour proposed to do is 2% higher than what the Tories do. Um, we are playing a game on the extremes of Europe. It is due to this man. Um, Shall I him back again? I, well, Bev will tell me you saw his face. This little graph here, I haven't enough time to explain the squiggly graph. The other one going up is the proportion of votes in European elections which are far right. 
First European election in 1979, no far-right votes. The National Front didn't stand. He goes up and up and up until 2014, when our Conservative Party had left the EPP and created its own group in the European Parliament, including Alternative for Deutschland as a member, which is far-right by European definition. 52.4% of people who voted in this country in 2014 voted far-right. We send the largest number of far-right MEPs to the Parliament in Brussels of any country. We are the European far right. We are a very polite far right, very civil <laughs> far right. The far right in Europe will be devastated without <laughs> us. Amazing things can happen. One reaction to the result, the 2017 election, the largest, fastest, most unpredicted swing of voting ever in British polling history. And it was so big, this is my last slide, that you can compare the swing that Attlee got, 10.4%, to the swing that Blair got, which was really a swing against 18 years of Conservative rule, of 8.8%. You can see that the next time Blair stood, he lost 2.5% of the votes. Next time, he lost 5.5%. When poor old Brown stood, we just had the biggest economic crash since 1929, and he lost even more than Blair. Lovely Ed Miliband stands. I really like Ed Miliband. He got a swing of 1.4%. You need about 12 more general elections on plus 1.4% to win. And the unelectable man who doesn't know what a plan is and can't lead anything gets what in effect is the biggest swing because it occurred in only two years. And even better, in the other cases, Labour win. And when you win, you disappoint. And when you disappoint, you don't win votes next time. By not winning, you're in a better situation. I'll end on Corbyn, just to rile you up for questions. <laughs> Which other leader of the opposition has presided over so many government defeats while having such a minority of MPs in the House of Commons? Have you ever seen it before? Now, it could all turn out badly. It could all turn out badly, but if things carry on going the way they're going, think how we'll actually look back on this and somebody who said he was 70% for, and he meant he was 70% for, because for all his very, very many failings, one of Corbyn's biggest failings is he cannot help but tell you the truth about what he actually <laughs> believes. It's just in his nature. It's the same thing as he can't fill in an expenses form. So he didn't, ever. Right? Part of the story of what's going on and what you remember now, remember the vilification of the leader of the opposition at a time when the government of the day suffered its biggest defeats, bigger than the 1920s defeats, and didn't get what they really wanted. Thank you very much. Are you clicking? I'm clicking. You're clicking. Well, thank you, Sally. Uh. Uh, Dan, is, Dan is going to do my slides for me, so uh, we, we have to synchronise synchronize speech and slide. Um, right, I'm going to talk mainly about education uh, because we, uh, Danny started off by saying, you know, what, what, what is a major reason why uh, we, we voted uh, to leave and older people voted? And one answer to this is um, that, um, okay, you can put my book on here. Uh, um, <laughs> a whole book on it, yeah, <laughs> this is the commercial break, um, the, is that um, uh, older people particularly uh, had had what, you know, we're beginning to call now an imperial education. Next one. Hands up those who remember the pink bits on the map at school. There you are, you see, quite a lot of people, yes. Because, you know, those pink bits, the, the maps like that were on classrooms walls until the 1960s in some cases the 1970s and this was uh, you know that surge of pride you got this 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 land it belonged to us you know who were us well of course they were the um, the imperialists who had um, walked into people's land and taken it over taking their land taking their labor taking uh, the um, uh, minerals and the the good things out of out of this country and as Danny has said once we got past the Second World War and um, um, we couldn't loot the empire anymore, um, then you know, we began to get poorer. And of course, the rich didn't like this. 
And, you know, it, it, it always struck me as very peculiar that even though people were invited to come from form, former colonial countries after the Second World War, we treated them so abominably. You know, I mean, the, the racism that was directed at people from our former colonies, and still is, and has got worse after Brexit, um, is really uh, something that we should be ashamed of as a country. But, of course, we're not, you know, because uh, we have this notion of, of cultural and linguistic and um, economic superiority. You know, we were superior to the rest of the world. There's no other country that calls itself Great Brit Great anymore. Uh, <laughs> Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, but they don't insist on being grand. Um, but we were great, but we're not going to be great anymore. Okay, now, um, the, the um, director of the uh, South Asian Center at LSE uh, actually noted that when he got students here uh, to, to teach, um, that um, uh, this was what they felt. The uh, students arrive at university completely ignorant of the empire, and this is last year, 2017. When we talk of Syria, they've no knowledge of Britain's role in the Middle East. Um, anybody remember the Balfour Declaration? Anybody remember the Sykes-Picot Agreement? We remember possibly Tony Blair and the ghastly um, mistakes that were made in 2003. Um, but uh, students that he found, they just don't know even about um, the, the past history and the present history of the Middle East. Uh, so uh, the uh, curriculum, which uh, incidentally um, was redone in 2013 in schools at the instigation of a guy called Michael Gove, who was Education Secretary, um, is not about to enlighten young people. Um, they do actually have a module that asks you, was the empire good or bad? You know, uh, right on one side of a piece of paper. Um, so uh, certainly the, um, this notion of nostalgia is, is, is still you know, with us uh, very much amongst, amongst people, uh, particularly the older people. Um, okay, here we are. Um, this is how a lot of people remember it. These were the, uh, the major uh, large colonist dominions, you know, the, the white dominions. And it was interesting that um, they followed in the footsteps of, of Great Britain, dear old dad there, um, but we didn't actually have so much celebration when we had people coming from what became called the new commonwealth, i.e. You know, people who weren't white. Uh, so um, what, what, what we have now is uh, 53 commonwealth countries, more or less, and of those, 31 of them have fewer than 3 million people. So when they go on about, we're going to have... Um, Commonwealth 2-0 to trade, and we've got all this trade coming. Oh, no, you know, 31 colonies. What 33 million people are going to turn up? On the other hand, 14 of them are tax havens. <laughs> I won't say hands up anyone who has money in a tax haven. <laughs> sure nobody here, of course, will have. Yeah. My college. Uh, right, so um, uh, the um, anxiety that we're going to, uh, you know, so... Um, uh, become a colony of the EU is something that um, some of our Brexiteers have been uh, pushing around. They're still using imperial language, you know, that we're going to be a colony. Uh, well, you know, who knows? Next one. Right, now here is the guy taking back control. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I think, you know, one of the things that struck us when we were writing this book was that we did have control. Until 1947, we had control of 700 million people. No, we, had, we had an awful lot of <laughs> <laughs> Yes, right. Now, <laughs> can anyone read what... That's <laughs> brilliant. Can anyone read what's written on his beard, lass? <laughs> okay, it says IPA, yeah. Imperial Pale Ale. Even Nigel is drinking Imperial Pale Ale. Right. Now, this actually is, is quite an important uh, graph because um, uh, it's um, actually demonstrating that when uh, we do have Brexit, if it ever comes about, um, then the, the countries that are actually going to be most affected are the small countries. Ireland particularly is going to be affected. <clears throat> there was a study done by the ESRC which came out just a couple of days ago, literally, and they have forecast that 80,000 jobs are at risk in, in Ireland, in, um, not, not in Northern Ireland, in, in uh, the um, 
the Irish Republic. Um, I like horses, and a lot of those 14,000 of them are actually people who look after horses. So I do hope that the horses and their jockeys and trainers and that will be all right. But other countries, you can see Malta, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Cyprus, um, you know, the, these smaller countries, they are all going to be very badly affected um, by losing trade and losing um, the um, uh, things that, that they, um, you know, the, the, the so-called mother country uh, traded with them. Are they going to lose uh, exports, financial? Can you, can you read them, Danny, foreign... Foreign direct investment. For that. Yeah, there's an awful lot that these, these small countries are actually going to, going to lose. Um, right, uh, so uh, shall we go on the next one? The key thing is the big countries don't lose much, which is why you don't get a good deal. We've got more Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, get rid of Nigel. There we go. <laughs> Can have too much Nigel. <laughs> Right, now this just shows, you see, uh, the, um, the countries of the British Empire by populations, and you can see, well, you'll all know the biggest, biggest country. Yeah, big green one. I India, obviously, yes, and India went in 1947. Uh, and then these are, these are all the other countries that were in the British Empire by, by population. And this is something, of course, people knew. I mean, how many people now, you know, remember when uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone... Um, uh, Somaliland, Yemen, you know, southern Yemen, that was a British protectorate, and look at what's happening there. We're selling arms to the Saudis to bomb one of our former protectorates. So strange things happen in history. Um, but this just shows that the British Empire was very important in shaping uh, the, 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 the ethnicity and the identity of people in Britain today. And it also forms our contemporary attitudes to immigration um, because, um, you know, this... Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, we, we go off on a lot in the book about immigration because, of course, one of the things that um, people have gone on about it when they voted Brexit was, oh, too many immigrants, too many refugees, and so on and so on. Um, in fact, our first Immigration Act was in 1905, which was to keep out Jewish people and Eastern European people. And that was, you know, well over 100 years ago. And since 1962, we've had 16 Immigrant Control Acts. So when people say, take back control, and oh, we don't want immigrants, we've been controlling migration for a long time. Now, back to education. Uh, this is my, uh, uh, an M I collect old textbooks, but I, I didn't bring them along. But this is my Empire Youth Annual from 1948. And you'll notice the Mountie there. Uh, anyone from Canada? Yeah. Right, yeah, there you are. <laughs> Um, there, there's the mountain, and then in the corner there, there's um, the, there's these, this happy middle class couple, white couple, who are doing uh, a train journey in 1948 uh, through Uganda and Kenya, and of course they're looking at the animals outside. Notice the black servant behind them. And my Empire Youth Annual of 1948 does not mention at all that these countries actually, <laughs> the people who live in them, would rather like their countries back. Uh, and, of course, when uh, particularly um, some of you will remember the, um, the, the, uh, the wars in the 1960, uh, was violent conflict in some areas, particularly in Kenya, and it was only last year that some of the Kenyans who fought in their war of independence in the 1960s actually got reparations from the British government for the torture that they suffered uh, during the independence uh, of Kenya. Um, my Empire Youth Annual never mentioned anything about that. It actually um, mentioned also an exciting train journey from Lahore to Delhi. And it never once mentioned that the previous year there'd been massacre. You know, there'd been bloodbath on that train track. And so you, you just wondered what on earth you were being told and what children, youth were being told in 1948. They were also told, I don't know, does anyone remember the groundnut scheme? Yeah, some would remember. Do you remember? This was a scheme to grow pe uh, groundnuts or peanuts, incidentally. Uh, and it was a scheme to, to grow a lot of peanuts in West Africa and East Africa to make margarine. It was funded by Unilever, and the margarine was, was for the, um, the, the British to eat. 
and um, uh, it, it, the, the, again, it, um, it's quite interesting, this exciting venture, it goes on about the natives, it actually uses the word natives over and over again, the natives will, will plant the seeds, the natives will harvest the crops, the natives will carry the bags, and then, you know, right at the end it says, oh, and what's more, it's going to be a, a really good thing because uh, we, it'll bring money into the British Empire, and it actually referred to the British Empire, and again, this is 1948. Next one. Yeah, okay, this is just the, <laughs> the last one. This is, I, I could have, you know, written an awful lot about this, but here we, um, uh, we had Edgar Rice Burroughs. You're, Tarzan, hands up those who remember Tarzan. Yeah, there you are. Um, he's, uh, he was actually an American, um, but he wrote all about um, this. Um, he was actually an aristocrat, was Tarzan. He was, he was Lord Greystoke, and he was forever swinging through the jungle, um, saving white women and also killing black men. And, you know, this was what, what children watched in films. And there was actually another Tarzan film released in 2016. Just, you know, a couple of years ago, we had another Tarzan film. And that is, is actually a picture. Here is this white guy, actually with a knife at the throat of a black guy. It's no wonder we've got knife crime. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, and then on the other side, there's a, there's a, a quotation from um, a book that actually, uh, a textbook that I have that um, actually goes, um, it went, it was, it was uh, used in schools right into the 1960s and 70s. And I do suspect that, um, uh, that even Boris Johnson, who was at his prep school in 1970, um, I've got a book uh, that he must have studied that actually describes the races of mankind as three races, the Caucasian, the white race, the Mongoloid as the yellow race, and the black race. Um, and um, uh, that book actually is 1976 in Sussex prep, prep school, and Boris Johnson went to a, a school in Sussex, a prep school. So this is where presumably we got the watermelon smiles and the pickaninnies that uh, he's so fond of quoting. But uh, this textbook actually quoted, uh, under the guidance of Europeans, Africa is steadily being opened up. And that was a textbook that was in use in the 1970s in this country. And so you just wonder what on earth, you know, people were writing about. Um, Keith Joseph was an education secretary. I remember him well. He retired in 1985. And uh, when he, he left office, he made a, a very nice speech. And he said... Um, that British history and traditions should be part of the cultural heritage of all who live in this country. And schools should be responsible for transmitting British culture uh, enriched by so many traditions. Well, okay, you know, you could make a list of, of what, what were our good traditions, but um, cynics might think that, that these traditions included uh, military conquest, um, slavery, forced labor, takeover of, of land, um, and um, indentured labour, denial of human rights, and so on and so on. Um, I suppose I'd better just uh, finish by... Um, oh, well, I could go on, actually, because I haven't... No! <laughs> no. I will not go on, no. yeah. But I will just finish by saying that, as Danny pointed out, uh, a lot of these um, uh, people who are currently uh, down there in the House of Commons, or they might have gone home now, um, talking about what we're going to do. A lot of these men who are Brexiteers were actually educated at public schools which were um, traditionally, their traditional values were racism, militarism, so-called patriotism, um, feelings of superiority. Um, every day they had double confidence, you know, on a, uh, not just on a Friday. And... Um, it is actually quite important uh, that to, make, to keep making this point that the people who actually think they are running us now have been educated in this very, very peculiar imperial curriculum. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. And welcome, Gaminda. Thank you. So my role here is as discussant to the book, and I would like to just start by saying that I think Danny and Sally have produced an excellent and necessary book that situates the politics of and the debates around Brexit within the wider context of Britain's imperial past. And there's much that I could pick up from the book itself, but I really want to focus my comments here around a couple of the key issues within it. Firstly, there's the question of who voted 
for Brexit. And Danny provided us with excellent graphs and indications that, that pointed to who it was who actually did deliver the vote. But if you go back to the time of the referendum and think about much of the media representation, and also I have to say much of the academic scholarship, it was mostly focused around this idea of the white working class, that they were the ones who'd felt disenfranchised, who'd felt uh, dislocated as a consequence of globalizing processes, and as a consequence of that, because they had lost out within this particular context, that they had voted for Brexit. But within the book, and also within earlier work that Danny has done on the topic, he's done much to correct that narrative by pointing in part to the only robust data that we have in terms of who voted, the Lord Ashcroft polls, and highlighting the ways in which the disproportionate vote for Brexit did not come from the white working class, but rather from the propertied, pensioned, and well-off white middle class. As Lorenzo Antonucci and colleagues have also demonstrated through their qualitative research, there's absolutely no correlation between self-identifying as working class and voting leave. But there is a correlation between self-identifying as middle class and voting leave. So why has the liberal commentariat so focused on ensuring that the outcome of the vote is framed in terms of the disenfranchisement of the white working class? Perhaps because to recognize that it was white middle class communities who disproportionately voted to leave might prompt a degree of self-reflection and that self-reflection was probably deemed to be too uncomfortable. If it was the white working class who voted to leave, then we could displace concerns about race and the way in which race intersected with these debates by pointing to the otherwise legitimate grievances of a disenfranchised group. If, however, it was the white middle class, then that deflection is not plausible, and we would be required to address the constitutive aspect of race much more directly. Further, we need to consider the fact that the British working class is not only white. A significant proportion of this socioeconomic constituency is made up of darker citizens. <coughs> darker citizens voted to remain by 65 to 73%. As such, it cannot be claimed that the economically disadvantaged British working class voted to leave. They voted to remain. But why are all the concerns about the working class framed in terms of their whiteness? Why is there such a racialization of this socioeconomic category? To answer this, I want to turn to a second key theme. And that's the common misunderstanding of Britain as a nation, when in fact it's always been an empire. The very structuring of the debates around Brexit has been predicated on the idea of Britain as a nation. And what was being called for with the referendum was a return to national sovereignty. And yet Britain has never been a nation state exercising national sovereignty. It's always been an imperial state. When Britain was formed through the Act of Union in 1707, the kingdoms of England and Scotland already had established colonies, including the colony of Ireland and those in the so-called New World. And after Union, they went on to establish an empire that covered a quarter of the Earth's territory and governed over one-fifth of its population including by the 1920s, half of the world's Muslims. As an empire, Britain was irredeemably multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious. Britain doesn't become multicultural after Windrush. It was always multicultural. It's rather that the histories we tell ourselves are histories of purification, not of the truth. So why does recognizing the history of Britain as a nation or as an empire matter? I would suggest that much of the debate around the vote was organized in terms of calling into being a British public whose legitimacy as citizens and as the proper objects of public policy 
was predicated on belonging historically to the nation state. If, however, as I've argued, Britain hasn't been a nation state, but an imperial state, then its borders historically are much broader than we understand them to be in the present. And similarly, the legitimate constituencies of the present have to then be recognized as being broader than the ways in which they've been depicted. So for example, the first time that Britain legislated for citizenship wasn't till 1948. It wasn't till the British Nationality Act was passed in that year that there was a legal form of citizenship that was established. Prior to that, everybody within Britain and the empire were subjects, not citizens. After 1948, there were two main types of citizenship that were established. One was that you would be a citizen of the UK and its colonies. This was a common shared citizenship across the metropole and the colonial areas. There was no separate citizenship for being in Britain. It was shared by people in the colonies. That was one type. And the second type of citizenship was Commonwealth citizenship. These were the two categories. And Commonwealth citizenship was given to everybody who lived within a country that was a former colony of Britain and was now part of the Commonwealth. It was also available to Irish citizens who even though they were recognized as if they were in the Commonwealth, they hadn't actually, well, they had actually refused to join the Commonwealth after independence. But because of the numbers of Irish people who moved to Britain to work, it was too difficult to create a whole new category for them. So within Hansard, the actual wording is that we will treat Ireland as if it were in the Commonwealth, and we will treat Irish citizens as if they were Commonwealth citizens in order to get around that anomaly. So these forms of citizenship were given to in excess of 800 million people in 1948 with all the rights to come and live in Britain, settle here, and work here. And you might sort of say, you know, why on earth would any country give citizenship to 800 million people? One of the things that you have to remember is up until this point, the direction of movement was not from the rest of the world to Britain, it was from Britain to the rest of the world. For how does an empire get established except through the movement of populations? So it was Brits moving to the lands that come to be known as the Americas, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, to establish settler colonies, and then also to take into colonial context the other parts of the world as well. So those movements outwards had created a sense or had created an empire, and in creating an empire, even at the point when that empire is in the process of being dismantled, there's a sense of how does Britain maintain its global space or its global stature within the world. One thing was, was to make everybody citizens so that Britain could still say that it had the largest empire stroke now Commonwealth. But then what happened was that people from the darker Commonwealth began to exercise their citizenship rights and start moving to Britain. That wasn't expected. It was that sort of aspect, well, we gave you these rights, but we didn't really expect you to come. <laughs> and so now what do we do? And what they did was establish a moral panic around what they called colored immigration. And one of the things to remember at this point is that within government debates, the concern was only about colored immigration. But in this period, the first couple of decades after the war, the majority of people who moved to Britain were actually paler migrants and not darker citizens. Because the people who came from the Commonwealth were not migrants. They came as citizens of the UK. The migrants who came from the labor camps within Europe were people from places like Poland, the Baltic states, and so on, who came through the European Voluntary Workers Scheme they came as migrants, and together they outnumbered darker citizens who came by a factor of 10 to 1. So all the concerns about colored migrants were about, that, were about the 10% of people who had come and who had actually come as citizens. But nonetheless, what this led to was the passing of the Commonwealth Immigration Acts in the 1960s and early 70s. 
And what these acts did was begin to take citizenship rights away from people, effectively on the basis of the colour of their skin, because it continued to allow paler citizens of the broader Commonwealth to enter Britain, but it began to restri restrict entry from those darker parts of, of the Commonwealth. And so what, it, what began at that point was the process of turning darker citizens or some citizens into migrants. And I would suggest that that's the process that's taking place with Brexit at the moment. So entry into the European Economic Community in 1973 was accompanied by the curtailing of rights of darker British citizens. And as we seek to leave the European Union, this is accompanied by the curtailing of rights of non-UK EU citizens, and also the curtailing of our rights in terms of being able to travel and live in 27 other countries. So we're also losing our rights in the process. And I would just want to suggest that it's not possible to understand the disenfranchisement that's currently occurring of non-UK EU citizens separate from this previous, earlier, more extensive disenfranchisement that happened of darker British citizens with the Commonwealth Immigration Acts. And the consequences of those acts we continue to see explicitly in operation today. So the Windrush scandal, and I should just state that the Windrush scandal doesn't just affect people from the Caribbean, but actually people from the whole of the Commonwealth. And there's also the stripping of citizenship from people like Shamima Begum, amongst many others, which is part of this process of having created a two-tier citizenship which is explicitly racialized. For those who appreciate irony, it's salutary to note that our entry into the EEC in 1973 was accompanied by deep hostility to darker Britons, splits across both political parties, and a voice calling from a minority Ulster Unionist base, just as is the case in the present. Britain has hardly confronted its imperial past, but that surely is the rock upon which it is breaking. To be British, of whatever hue, is to be formed by empire, and not to recognize that is not to recognize ourselves and the variety of selves that we are. Sally mentioned Michael Gove earlier. One of his initiatives whilst he was Secretary of State of Education was to transform the national curriculum for the teaching of history in secondary schools. And what he wished to do was to confine the teaching of British history to a book called Our Island Story. So in the context of me saying that the British Empire had covered one quarter of the Earth's territory and governed over one fifth of its population. To think that you could tell British history simply by focusing on our island story. And even within that, forgetting that other little bit that we're not just one island, we are actually an island and a bit. <laughs> and that might explain some of the current confusion that the cabinet has in remembering <laughs> the, the history just next door. The processes of decolonization that led to the dismantling of empire were accompanied by our simultaneous entry into the European economic community. And I would suggest that that has meant that in Britain, people have never had to deal with what it means to go from being a global empire to being a small state, cooperating as an equal with other small states. It's never had to properly account for the colonial past or to navigate its post-colonial legacy in the present. It's been quickly forgotten, or at least it's been forgotten south of the border with Scotland, that just a couple of years earlier, Scotland voted to remain in the EU, uh, remain in the UK, that was a part of the EU. And indeed, the EU, with its dispersal of powers, has served as a break upon the movement of Scotland to full independence. In a similar way, the EU has also enabled the management of Britain's relationship with Ireland, of its former colony, and the creation of a common Irish space in which different identities are possible and can coexist peacefully. This is now threatened by an English nationalism that's oblivious to its own history. The Brexit hostility to Brussels 
masks the extraordinary centralization of the British state, which is itself a consequence of empire. It seems that Britain now seeks to leave the EU because it cannot share sovereignty as one amongst equals, only now to reproduce that problem in the way in which England cannot share sovereignty and act as one amongst equals with the constituent parts of the UK. Could there be a more unstable future from the failure to understand the past? While Danny and Sally end their book on a more optimistic note, I'm afraid this is a point at which I depart from their analysis. <laughs> I would underline what Danny said at the very outset in his comments here today, that if we don't understand our past, the shared histories that have produced our multicultural and post-colonial present, then I don't think we have any possibility of creating a politics that's adequate for our time and for our people. Fabulous. Thank you very much, all of you. We're going to have some time for questions now to, and I suspect there will be a lot, to get in as many as possible. We'll do three at a time and then I'll open them out to people if that's okay, unless there's anything that Sally and Danny would like to say in response. No. Okay, so open it out. The people with microphones on either side and I'll shout three of you at once, so bear with me. Okay, one over there. One at the back, and actually another one over there. Yep. Hi. One, um, one, one. Yep. It's not working. Um, hi. Um, how much does... Um, well, you can first say that equality, liberty, and fraternity in this country has been damaged by Brexit, that it's kind of splitting people up. Could the panel sort of explain what they think about all the manipulation of this older generation of middle-class, pensioned, property people that were manipulated by the media and social media and the, even the news. Could, could the panel talk about that for a minute? Okay, great. We'll move to the next question, which is just there, and then one right at the back. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Professor Bhamra. What exactly do you mean by empire? Because if the existence of diverse territories within one state is empire, then India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are all empires as well at the present moment. Okay. Oh, you can tell that. So what do you mean by empire? Uh, if India, Bangladesh and are also empires. Okay. And then at the back. Uh, hi. That, I have a question like this. That, uh, does Brexit that anything relating to the back to 500 years ago when the Church of England was separate from Vatican? Because after Church England separate, the British Empire was born. And now some people they just think that we could reform a new empire. So what do you think about it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Did you that's like yeah, the the role of the Vatican and can we form a new empire? Uh, okay, who wants to kick off with that? Raminda, do you want to start with those three? Equality, fraternity, liberty, empire definition, and the role of religion, I presume, in forming a new empire. Well, maybe I can respond to the question about is an empire just about diversity? I mean, I don't think an empire is just about diversity. Empire was a political process that, was, that has been in... I mean, well, there's a long history. So the way in which I think about empire and colonialism is to think about the ways in which historical processes over the last 500 years effectively have produced the modern world as a consequence in, in large part of Europeans going around much of the world, eliminating the populations that exist in the lands that they encounter, dispossessing them of land, liberty and resources, and extracting the resources and wealth of, place, of, of, of other places in order to build up their uh, territories back at home. So in a sense, I think empire is an extractive political relationship between territories that aren't uh, contiguous. And so in that sense, the establishment of British empire over a quarter of the world's territory has been a process that went on and it went on through corporations, through uh, 
missionaries, through different varieties, to establish a political system in that way. So in that sense, I don't think it's just an issue of diversity, but the process of incorporating other lands, other peoples, other religions into your political framework is what produces that entity as being a multicultural or multinational entity. And in that sense, the point that I was making was that when we talk about Britain as being multicultural, we usually talk about it as only becoming that in the post-war period after the arrival of Empire Windrush. And I want to suggest that actually Britain, in terms of its polity, has been multicultural since it started its imperial endeavours, which was from the point at which Britain comes into being. And so in that sense, we need to have a different way of understanding multicultural Britain as being a legitimate part of the history of how we understand Britain itself. Okay, so Danny, would you like to choose a question or okay. try and answer them all? I'll see which one, Sally. <laughs> um, I, I'll try and do yours. I mean, I, I could go on and on about the manipulation, but the manipulation begins with the textbooks um, before you even get onto the tabloids and the Telegraph and the Barclay Brothers and how you know, who owns this, and, and the beliefs of the people in W1A, which again are formed in, the, in their schools. But um, let's talk Catholics. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there is an interesting thing about this. See, we're having to learn how to go down from having been the richest place in the world 130 years ago. The place that was the richest before us by far was Amsterdam and the United Provinces, which was Protestant. And then there is a connection between the making of money from trade and, and that particular... My full name is Daniel Francis Luke Dawling, which kind of gives away <laughs> those who know their subtleties. Um, and then we had something we didn't call an invasion in 1688. Uh, and the centre of the richest part of the world moves over to here, and then it's moved over to another, what was largely Protestant nation in the, in the United States. So there is this pattern... Um, associated with a particular religion. Uh, the wonderful thing is that next is the country in the world with the highest number of atheists and agnostics, which is China. So this, this thing is broken uh, at this point. But it, it, it is worth pointing out, lastly on that, and the other reason I wanted to, to say it, uh, the north of Ireland was anyway approaching a Catholic majority because of fertility before the migration from the A8 countries meant that that accelerated with particularly a group of Polish people who came to meet packing factory, but it was a few more. It is worth looking at the rise in popularity of the DUP, which are on the extreme right of politics in Northern Ireland, and the extent to which the rise of the success of the DUP within Northern Ireland was associated with a fear of a Catholic majority in the North and what that then means for the island of Ireland. So these old things haven't gone away. That's a brilliant answer, because when you think about the role of the DUP in holding the Conservative government to ransom, or at least to holding them to pay billions, yeah. um, that's... I, just think, I, I don't know if I'm a hostage for... Let me say one more. I said this at the last talk, so I shouldn't do it. The DUP are quite remarkable. They're worth looking at. Um, they, well, they don't... They don't believe in evolution, and when I, when I, but I mean, the reason I, but don't laugh, and I'm sorry to, when I did this at the last talk, somebody came up to me and said, Danny, brilliant talk, I agree with everything, but, but you know that evolution is actually not true. So <laughs> apologies to anybody else who doesn't believe in evolution. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sally, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, well, um, I mean, just on the DUP, um, we perhaps forget that, remember Enoch Powell? Hands up those who remember him, pal. Yes. yes, you know. I mean, he, you know, was, um, uh, well, I regard him as an extremely dangerous person, although um, a lot of people thought he was absolutely marvellous. Yes, yeah, so and when, when he grave, died, his yeah. obituaries, you know, were, were, oh, what a great man he was. He actually, uh, when he got sacked by Edward Heath uh, for his anti-immigrant speeches, he went over and, and joined, joined the Unionist Party uh, in 1974, and he was a Unionist MP um, what, for until 1987, I think. Um, so, you know, the, the DUP is, is actually... Um, uh, 
as dangerous as Enoch Powell, as you might say, you know, all fit together. And more expensive. Yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> Just another million down the sofa, you know, for the DUP if they'll vote for us. But they didn't, did they? No. Um, Right. Uh, just a word on, on someone asked about older people. Um, I mean, I'm quite interested in um, whether if there was another vote, you know, whether older people still would vote uh, to leave um, in the way they did, because I actually live in a village where everybody is over 60. Well, nearly everybody. And um, uh, it voted. We know the whole village more or less voted leave. And, you know, when I go and talk to my neighbours and so on, they would still vote leave, even though their biggest fear is that their children and grandchildren are going to have a very tough time, you know, in the future. And yet they can't sort of make any connection between their voting and their view of, of, um, uh, of what's going to happen. And, of course, a lot of this, as we've been saying, is down to their um, views of that it's going to be great again, it should be all right, but somehow it's somebody else's fault, you know, it's, it's not our fault that, um, uh, that, that the, um, we, we've not agreed on any Brexit. Um, on empires, just a quick word there. Um, I, I'm not an expert on other empires, apart from the British Empire, um, but I do, you know, think somebody ought to look hard at the American empire, um, because the Americans have an empire, and they have... Um, bases all over the world, 800 bases. And if anyone remembers the Chagos Islands, um, OK, well, the, the, they were British. They were French first, then British. And the British cleared them off in the 1960s and literally cleared, cleared the islanders off so they could sell it to the Americans uh, to build the biggest, what's still the biggest air base in the world. Um, so, you know, this is part of the American empire that, the, that they've taken over from the British empire. Um, so, uh, all in all, I don't think empires are actually a good idea. <laughs> I wish we could have, a, well, we should, you know, be working towards a world without empires. Okay, mm. I'm going to go upstairs next, for those down here that can't see all upstairs. Yes, in the middle there. Um, over here at the bottom, and then... Any more upstairs? Oh, yeah, one at the back. So where did the microphone go? <laughs> yeah, Hello. great. Hi. Um, so my understanding is that the kind of conclusion to Danny and Sally's book is that there's some kind of positive outlook, that perhaps this might lead, in the end, to a more equal society. And I'd be interested in hearing about what that is and how you've come to that conclusion, but also perhaps Kaminda's reservations about that. OK, and I think it was over here. Ah, no, right at the end. Hi, so um, from this talk we've seen that there's been quite a negative effect from British imperialism on um, its former colonies. To, to what extent do you think there's been a positive effect in, in some sense? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get that one. What that, to, what ex is that the, to what extent there's been a positive effect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Yeah. Okay, any positives? <laughs> and then that one right at the back there. <laughs> it's the optimist in the room. Hi. Uh, just, uh, I think that there's an interesting um, counterintuitive point because if we think that the rise of a nationalist sentiment in the UK is because of a longing of empire, but if we see the history of empires as clearly multicultural, purely political project, because most empires were multicultural, and empires didn't begin with Europeans plundering. I mean, empires have been there for a while, and probably the, lo the longest standing empire is the Chinese uh, empire, uh, came out, out of the consolidation of the Qin dynasty. Uh, so how can we explain that this longing for a very modern project, which is the national state, uh, comes from the longing for empire that by definition has been multicultural. Longing for, did you hear that? Longing for empire that is clearly multicultural. Why? Okay, who would like to, do we want to go in the same order? Yeah. You go first. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so um, the reservation, well, but do you not want to say what your conclusions were? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be positive first. You can tell why we're, why we're wrong. Um, 
me, me and Sally are both uh, more than usually optimistic people. And, and also, you just don't want to end the book saying... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to have the good ending, exactly. And, and we didn't know, you know, just honestly. Um, but the nearest parallel is Suez, the Suez crisis. A moment of deep shame, the elite getting it wrong, being told you can't do this. Um, and you don't have to go that many years forwards from Suez to see the young rejecting the views of the old, a cultural revolution in Britain, um, a judge telling a jury, is this a book you would want your wife and servants to read? And being told, yes, although we don't have servants anymore. Um, the whole of the 1960s and a, and a government that came in in 1964 that for the first time brought in education for the majority of children where you could go to the same school as other people. Now, it maybe wouldn't all have happened with Suez, but good things tend to come out of terrible embarrassments and defeats. Normally, tragically, it's war, uh, which is better. We have certainly taught the young that the old can't be trusted. Um, we have seen the young behave for the first time since the late 80s uh, in that they're willing to vote. We have galvanized Scotland. The Prime Minister herself has sent an email to 5.8 million people telling them she couldn't give a stuff about their views. Now, I don't know if any of you received the email. Yeah? I mean, you know, we didn't get one. This is if you sign a petition for a vote. I mean, oh, you didn't get the email. They, it was, well, it's the, biggest, it's the biggest spam in history, so the server couldn't actually cope. And a few hours later, they sent another email saying, oh, we're going to debate it on the April the 1st, which I guess is that happening now? God knows. April the 1st, yeah. Um, you know, if you, if, if you were trying to wake a set of people up to say you should get involved, you can't just assume it'll all be okay. Mm -hmm. I really can't think of a better way than this. Um, and that is part of the optimism. Also, when you are the most economically unequal country in the whole of Europe, there really is one, only one direction in which you can go. Uh, the wages of the highest paid people in this country have been plummeting. The highest paid people are bankers. We used to have 2,700 of them paid over a million a year. The ones who used to get 10 million are now nearer to five. There, no banker has had a pay rise since the 23rd of June 2016. Because, I know, <laughs> <laughs> because you don't need to attract them to London anymore because you're telling them they need to go to Frankfurt and Paris and Stuttgart and Dublin and they're moving I was at a talk in the Diwai Foundation last night where the, Di the Diwai Bank is saying of course we're moving and it's so expensive to move we would never have done this and they move an office over which they've established and having done that they have a choice and their choice, and many other the smaller banks already, is to move the CEO and the chief operating officer over to the mainland where the capital has to be legally, regardless of whether we revoke, because the trust has been lost. So the finance industry is beginning to move. There is no passporting, nothing. The finance industry is beginning to move. They reckon it will take 12 years to move the bulk of it. They'll leave the back office, the branch plant, here in London. Now... You may think, oh, this is terrible, and it is kind of in terms of raising money. But if you think that banking actually should be more spread out across Europe, and we shouldn't be a, a nation in awe of bankers, this actually moves us towards that. When I was a child, the highest paid people in this country were doctors, and they were paid more than bankers. Somebody's got to be the highest paid. And your choice is what kind of country do you want, want to be in? Optimistic, Sally. Yeah, well, you know, we did end up trying to be optimistic, didn't we? Yes, um, because you know, uh, Danny has been explaining, um, we might actually have the chance to actually become more normal, because we, we've not been a normal country. You know, this gross inequality that we've been got used to tolerating, uh, this uh, um, antagonism to migrants, refugees, whatever. 
Uh, and then, of course, we now have to cope, and I think it is quite serious, actually, as somebody's mentioned, um, the, the white supremacist movement, which is, is going to be something we have to take, take account of. But nevertheless, we, we are, the young are multicultural much more. They actually accept this. We live in a multicultural, multiracial, multireligious world, uh, despite Islamophobia and so on. Um, the, the next generation of the younger generations, and I've got grandchildren who are, I hope, you know, of this kind, um, they think like this, that they will live in a globalized multicultural world. They're not citizens of nowhere, they are citizens of, of, of a world, a multicultural, multiracial world. And so that's, you know, that's one of the reasons I feel optimistic. The other thing, of course, is the food. Um, in, um, in 1924, there was a big em empire exhibition, you see, and in London, and this was to uh, showcase goods to the world, especially food, and what can you make? Um, well, um, the, they decided, the organisers, to make um, a Christmas pudding. Um, so they sourced the, the ingredients for this Christmas pudding from every part of the empire, um, you know, they got um, currants from Jamaica or wherever, and, and they got flour from, um, I've forgotten the countries, but I do know they got eggs from Cyprus, and I did wonder why they brought eggs all the way from Cyprus. You know. Anyway, they made this Christmas pudding, and uh, it was called the Imperial Christmas Pudding, and uh, then they persuaded the royal family to eat it. <laughs> And, and this was, you know, a big thing, yeah. Anyway, so that was the, the Christmas pudding. But there was an interesting guy who um, uh, sourced um, uh, a type of cook of cooking. Uh, he was an Indian guy, and um, he produced Balti food. And he was, uh, his name was Mr. Biraswamy. And he started the very first Indian restaurant in Regent Street in London. And it was very popular. And, you know, one of the things that followed on from Mr. Viraswamy is it's now our favourite food, isn't it, after fish and chips, or maybe it comes before, before fish and before. chips. Before. Yeah. Chicken tikka masala. Exactly, yes. So, you know, in our food, if people, you know, we are, we are definitely multi-cuisine-ish, <laughs> whatever the word is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kavinda? Oh, yeah. and you. Um, so, I mean, I guess if you're sort of suggesting a comparison with Suez, Suez was followed by a period of economic growth and mass public spending, as you were talking about yourself. I mean, I think we're thinking about the period that we're in at the moment, since the 70s at least, we've been on a secular decline of growth, and uh, there is no money to invest in public works, as you presented in the graph where the second bottom country in the whole of the EU in terms of the amount that we yeah. spend. But that's our choice. We, we, Absolutely. We, we, yeah, we, we are choosing to spend lower than anybody else in, and to have the cheapest health service. It's a choice. And I don't see through our voting patterns that we're voting for alternatives to that. We continue to vote for austerity yeah. since 2010. And, if it, so. and in sewage, you'd have thought just the same because, you know, after that short lived government in 1945, it's 13 years a Conservative um, well, but I, I'm being optimistic. I should just I, let me have a go at the colony. Uh, the most successful form well, depends how you measure the success, because not necessarily the happiest, especially now. But the, the 13 colonies of, the, of North America, uh, those who left first, and when they left, we burnt down the first White House when they tried to leave, um, and we called them in effect terrorists. We became much stricter, nastier to stop any other colony le leaving. If you compare British former colonies, not, not, not the USA, they tend to, to have done better than similar parts of the country that were not British colonies. Um, the extreme, uh, so China does better than India and so on. Um, except for the very poorest countries, Belgium and the Congo and the Portuguese and, the, and their colonies, but they were very small. So, so in general, I'm afraid the, the comparison is if you could have chosen whether the area you lived in was to be invaded by the British or somebody else, um, or preferably nobody at all, the British, the British wasn't good. The, the question at the back about, about other empires, uh, the, the three largest cities on this side of Euro, Eurasia are London, Moscow and Istanbul. They're all the relic hearts of former collapsed 
multicultural empires. And at the time that each collapsed, it was very bad news for the heart of the empire. It was very bad news for the Ottoman Empire and its heart mm. when that collapsed. When the USSR collapsed in 1989, mortality rates rose in Russia and in, and in Moscow. And right now, the only place in the whole of Europe where mortality rates are rising and have been since 2014 is here. Mm. There's a pattern to what happens um, when you lose. And that status of losing isn't necessarily immediate with a particular date. Um, people have a sense that things have gone very badly wrong, and they're kind of right. It's just that the reason they've gone wrong is not the reason people were told. And we haven't mentioned it. It is not because people turned up in large numbers, particularly when we, in, again, Enoch Powell went out to the Caribbean and invited people to come when he was Secretary of State for Health, and a few years later said how terrible it was they came. <laughs> we opened up the gates early to Eastern Europe and invited people to come and got the most able, fittest, finished migrants, the people with the most get up and go, who could always come first. And having done that, and that was our choice to do that, having done that, just a few years later, we say how terrible it is that they came. We asked them to come by opening early. The stupidity of not realizing how much was in our control. Take back control is it, it, really about something else. It's a memory of a, of a time when we lauded it over so many more people, and that is never coming back. OK, come in, did you want to continue? Yes, I mean, one of the reasons why it's not coming back is that aspect that when Liam Fox decided to establish this thing called Empire 2.0, there wasn't really a resounding sort of wish for that globally when people have remembered Empire 1.0. I mean, this question about the positive effects of colonialism, I just, I mean, this, the short answer is no. There is no positive Music. effect Music. of colonialism. Music again, so there's uh, work that's been done by Utsa Patnaik, who's an economist at JNU, who's calculated that the amount that Britain took from India over two centuries of colonial rule was over in excess of $45 trillion. There isn't enough money within the British sort of state to pay back the extent that it took. And it didn't take that money simply to build up Britain, but it also invested that money in the other settler colonies, such as Canada, New Zealand, Australia, to help develop the economies there. So there's a compounded interest to the money that was extracted. On top of that, you then also place the fact that, as was reported in The Guardian today in 1943, as a consequence of deliberate public policy orchestrated by Churchill, led to the deaths of three million people in Bengal in the famine. It had nothing to do with drought or nature or climate change. It was entirely a consequence of public policy of the British government to cause the deaths through starvation of in excess of three million people. On top of that, you could put the fact that in the 1770s, when the East India Company ruled Bengal and it it operated a system of taxation, which it doubled taxation from the previous Mughal regime, and it, it appropriated all that taxation and sent it to Britain, so that when the crops failed in the 1770s, one third of the population of Bengal starved to death. This was in excess of 10 million people, and precisely because the East India Company wouldn't repatriate any of the money for the relief of starvation at that time. So if you're asking me whether music <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. Mike Davis's Victorian Holocaust is a horror of a book, which will give you even more to support your argument there, wouldn't it? It's incredible. Yes, I think uh, no compensation. I'm afraid we're out of time. So I know there's been lots of people with their hands up, so I'm really, really sorry about that, but we have to bring it to a close. There will be a reception outside. Uh, everybody will be outside signing their books and can talk to you. So I hope you'll join us for that, and I hope you'll say thank you again on a historic day. <laughs>